Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be painting on an 11 by 14 panel. The palette colors I'll be using, once again, is a very limited palette. For yellow, we're using CAD Yellow Light. For red, we are using CAD Medium, Red Medium, rather. And then, of course, for blue, uh, Ultramarine Blue, and then Titanium White. So just the three primaries and Titanium White. By the way, I'm using a, a new setup today. This is the Strata Mark II easel, which allows you to have the panel separate from the palette. I'm going to sketch in today's scene using a mixture of the CAD red medium and then ultramarine blue. Thin down just slightly with a little touch of the mineral spirits. I'm using Gamsol. Got some painting gloves on today. This is a good practice. Even though most of the colors that we're using don't have heavy metals, especially not like they used to, even the CAD yellow, which is really the only one that, that has the cadmium well, titanium is also has a, a metal in it, but does protect you somewhat from exposure to the skin. Although with uh, the heavy metals, really, it's about digesting them into your system. And so as long as you're not eating with a bunch of paint on your hands, you should be just fine. Today, I'm using uh, for the brushes. These are Robert. Uh, these are um, uh, Signet brush, brushes, rather. I use um, primarily flats. Hog, hog bristle brushes, sizes two, four, six, eight. Also a number two round. The scene today is going to concentrate on a little water scene. This is a, a little bit of a, a lake uh, near the Marthasville area in Missouri. I'm using a photo reference that's out of the shot because. I'm going to do some other things with it, so it's really not going to help you much to, to look at the scene. I'm, I'm using the scene primarily to stimulate my imagination to remember what I experienced when I scalded the, the particular uh, picture. So I'm going to use artistic license and, and do something a little different. Here, I'm just wanting to establish where th these trees were, which also is a composition element, which keeps the eye from going off the, um, the picture plane and keeping you hopefully engaged. Since we read from right to left, I mean, left to right. <laughs> oh boy. I tell you, it's been one of those days as you look at the screen and I'm trying to do a voiceover. So reading left to right, you would uh, stop at the tree mass and that helps hold your attention inside the, the picture frame. One of the things that caught my eye on this particular day that I took the photo, there were some unusual clouds and it was very windy. And so one of the things I'm going to try to do is to give a sense of the atmosphere using paint that it was a windy day, it was fairly warm. Tree leaves were, were blowing everywhere. So I want to, to try to establish that kind of a that kind of sense of of being able to feel the wind as you, as you look at this painting. Another technique I'm going to use today, which is a little bit different than I think what you've seen in some of the other videos, after sketching in, I'm going to paint in the larger shapes, of course, and then work on some smaller shapes within inside those large shapes. But then I'm going to go back in with the palette knife and show you how you can use the palette knife in the, the detail stage to produce some interesting effects that you could not get with a brush. By the way, uh, as we as we begin launching into this video now, 
If you like the content of the channel, please be sure to subscribe. And if you like this video, please uh, give me a thumbs up. And if you got a question or a comment that you would like to make, just drop it in and I will uh, look at that, give it approval. As long as you're not a troll, you'll, you'll be approved. And uh, I try to answer all, all questions or comments within about uh, 24 hours of, of uh, you posting them. Now here, of course, now I'm working on this. So like I mentioned, this is a new setup for me. This is the Strata Mark II easel. And I'll, I'll probably have another video telling you all about that at a later time after I have some use with this model. Youngest daughter's moving back home, and so she's going to be living in our basement for a couple of years as she launches into her first job, saves some money. But that means that my studio has moved upstairs to an upstairs uh, bedroom that we use for guests, so I've compromised a small space. Not that the basement was necessarily that big, but here it's even smaller. But I think this easel will work out just fine. It gives me plenty of room to do smaller works as well as larger works. So I'm using the, um, the mast for the, uh, the Mark II. But for the tray, I went with a cheaper option. They have a, a tray that's primarily used for watercolors. But it will fit on a, a tripod. It's just a flat piece of metal, basically, that has the hooks kind of already on on the metal metal plate, basically, so that it'll hang on the tripod. But it was only, I, I think at this point in time, $67 compared to like uh, 200 and something for the model that has the uh, wings and the um, uh, ability to close up. And I, I just didn't think that I absolutely had to have that. And this reduces the weight even further. So we'll try it. Also got a brush holder that they make that uh, fits nicely on the side of it. So that way I don't have to have side panels that have additional room for brushes. I can just hang them right in that brush holder that they designed, which fits on this, this uh, pallet tray. This, of course, uh, and of course now, because that, that palette is sitting flat, you, you can't see me mix the colors as well today. Or, well, you're not going to be able to see me at all, obviously, because I've got it focused on the painting itself. But keep in mind that there's, there's only four colors. So <laughs> if it's a blue, it's, it's some mixture of ultramarine blue. If it is a red, it is cad red medium or some mixture containing that in it. And then uh, for, for yellow, of course, it's CAD yellow white and then a titanium white. So when you're using such a minimalist palette of colors, it stands to reason that almost in every single mixture, there's going to be a little bit of each of those colors. So I, I don't know how beneficial it really is to watch me mixing those colors on a palette. I did purchase, even today as I'm doing this voiceover, uh, another hand palette so that in the next video I will actually be able to, um, for the videos at least, I'll be able to hold that up and show you some of the mixing in a much easier fashion than I'm able to do with my current uh, equipment and space limitations. One of the uh, viewers... For one of the videos, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly who that was, but asked me about lighting. And the best advice I can give about lighting, especially if you're like me, and I, I would imagine a lot of folks that paint uh, come across this problem, is that, you know, maybe you're painting one day in the basement, another day you're painting up in a spare bedroom, or outside, you know, outside it's not going to be a problem if you're painting in plein air, which is another reason to do a lot of plein air painting is to use natural light. But if you have to paint indoors, what kind of lighting should you should you uh, pry for? Well, I think there's so many variables. Uh, for example, in this particular bedroom, 
the the roof is at different angles and so the light bounces in different ways creating various shadows in various parts of the room so it'd almost be impossible for me to tell you exactly what what products to purchase what bulbs to use all i can tell you is that you really have to experiment on your own buy a few bulbs see see what works best for example, in this in this particular bedroom, uh, this house was uh, made in the 1930s. So if that gives you some idea of if maybe your home was from that period of time, maybe that would be f something beneficial for you to, to get a start with. I, I just went to one of the big box stores and bought some cheap uh, LED lights. These are, I think, 100 watts uh, daylight. And that's what I've, I'm using here as you see this demo, and I think the colors are pretty good. Another, another way to, to perhaps test it is to take photos of your painting outdoors and then compare them to paintings that you took in your studio using your current lighting situation. As you compare those pictures, it should become quite obvious to you how close the colors look. If if they're really off, you know, outdoors, of course, you want to take the picture at a, you know, 90 degree angle uh, to the ground in direct sun, uh, in sunlight. And then uh, if you're, you're, you should be staying in shadow with your camera as you take that picture. And try not to use some of the uh, magnifiers on your various uh, phone units that will distort the image, of course. So you will take some nice uh, uh, shots with, with uh, the best camera that you have, whether that be an iPhone camera or, or a regular camera, a digital camera, etc. And then take the same painting into your studio with your, all your lights, you know, the way you wish to have them when you're, when you're painting, and take some pictures and see how close those colors look to one another when you look at those pictures side by side, uh, those, those photographs, and then adjust accordingly. So if it's too dark, obviously you need a brighter bulb. If, um, you know, and, and, uh, and looking at how, uh, how much light is actually on that, uh, that canvas then from, from your lighting situation. There are certainly a lot of other videos dealing with lighting that might be more helpful to you that is not an area where I feel like I have a, a great amount of expertise. So happy to, to uh, direct you to some of those other folks. So once again, here, as, you, as you're watching, you'll notice that I'm using ultramarine blue, titanium white, and then, of course, it's always darker near the top of the sky from your visual viewpoint. And then the sky is less saturated with blue as you get closer to the ground plane. Notice that I have left the white of the canvas panel for the moment to indicate where some of the clouds are going to be. One of the mistakes that a lot of uh, newcomers make, and I was certainly one of them, is to try to paint the clouds. In other words, sometimes what you want to do is use your negative space to create the shape of the clouds rather than to try to paint directly clouds, whether that be out of the titanium white or some other kind of uh, variation. So as you can see, I basically cut in the clouds by simply painting the blues around them. And because there's so much green and blue in this particular composition, I'm going to do something different with the clouds as well. The clouds, in the photographs at least, only appear to be white. Now, slapping on a bunch of titanium white to indicate clouds is not going to be the most attractive thing to do. So, I'm going to make a mixture of titanium white with a little bit of the cad yellow. And then I'm also going to make a, another mixture of um, 
titanium white with a little bit of the cadmium uh, red and then uh, that will create a little bit of a pink and of course uh, red uh, and green um, uh, the cones in your eyes really crave the opposite color so that should that should provide some stimulation and relief from all of the greens to have some pink and yellow in these clouds now where would those colors appear for this type of cloud they would uh, normally you might see some of that around the edges especially because usually the clouds are covering up the sun the, the, the source of light so around the edges of the clouds you might want to uh, to make those those color shifts or at least that's how I'm going to do it in this particular composition another way to do it is that oftentimes especially if the the clouds are being backlit by the sun of some kind or maybe it's you know a sunrise or even if it's a sunset um, the darkest part of the cloud may be right in the middle is where you see various shades of gray and then whiter towards the edges in this composition I'm basically doing the exact opposite as a kind of experiment to see if that works what does that feel like I certainly sometimes noticed that uh, clouds can be like that but uh, I must honestly say with this composition I'm looking at the color values and determining that it needs some red it needs some yellow and so I'm going to find a place to use them and the sky is where I'm going to use them today. And while I have blue on the uh, the palette, you can tell now that I, I mixed an approximate green for the darkest darks. But um, for whatever reason, my mood, I, I guess you could say, I, I didn't start with my darkest darks today. I, I started with the sky and just... Uh, the blue pool of color to create the greens and so this particular green I've already put down is, is being a little bit more distant and then uh, judging the the value of the lake water in relationship to the sky it has to be dark well actually your water can be uh, lighter or darker uh, it, it all depends upon um, the sky plane and the um, foreground plane and the uh, middle plane in terms of uh, whether or not that water is going to be the lightest color or, or, or perhaps uh, second lightest or, or uh, what I'm trying to say is that the water will switch now normally the sky is the lightest and then uh, the background and then as you move towards the foreground it gets darker it gets there's more red in the uh, foreground uh, more yellow in the foreground is what I mean by that these color temperature changes and more blue in the background with whatever sits back further has more blue in the mixture with less uh, yellow and red and then as you approach the foreground usually uh, those foreground colors will have more red and more yellow so they're warmer so uh, the foreground is going to be more warmer and the back the background's going to be cooler, and uh, those color temperatures are determined by, by your base uh, primary. Continuing to adjust a little bit here. As I'm adding a few a few different strokes you may have noticed I, I did not release a video for quite a while I participated in the Augusta plein air event which was a wonder of a wonderful event by the way held uh, very local to me I'm in Washington Missouri and so I don't have to drive far it's it's the only uh, plein air event uh, competition, if you will, that I participate in. This year, um, I was very fortunate to ha uh, win a judges award in the theme paint for birds. Uh, 
There were about uh, 120 artists, I believe, that participated during the event. And so to be selected for one of those, I, I felt uh, very flattered that they uh, chose my painting for the judges' uh, award for that. One of the things I will say is that when you do a plein air event, be prepared. Your paintings will not turn out the way you wish them to turn out. I painted every single day of the event. Well, there may have been one day that I took off, but I, uh, job-related work I had to get done. But for the most part, I took part in at least uh, one. Uh, they had two two different uh, paint outs per day. So I always did at least one, sometimes both. I think it's good to, to pace yourself. If you are new to plein air, uh, a place like Augusta is a great place to go because it's an open uh, plein air event. In other words, you don't have to, to be judged into it. So if you are a pro, if you're a novice, you are welcome to paint as often as you wish. So that that really does help you grow in your skill. And there, they have various workshops presented by some of the professionals that they bring in each year. So I think I, I probably painted about 10 different paintings. Now, how many of them would I say were successful? Uh, maybe three. In fact, after the event was uh, over, I kind of lined some of them up in uh, in my studio and decided that uh, about three or four of them uh, went right to the trash. One of the things that, that I continue to do is I try to push myself to experiment at the Augusta Plein Air event. And sometimes when you experiment, things can go really crazy really quickly <laughs> so I did um, there was a quick draw event I did a, a palette knife only painting for that one I liked it uh, I'm not sure if others did it did not sell right away so But uh, plein air events in, in general, I don't know that I necessarily like to think of them as competitions. It's more of a celebration of art. I love going around and being able to see all these other painters and, and to go on site and see how many different compositions people decide on and what they choose to highlight how they render things or apply paint it 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 really is an interesting experience and in particular what you will find at least at the augusta event is that there are people of all different ability levels and so you can kind of see very clearly where you stand how far do you got to go to Reduce work that, that stands up to some of the professionals that are there. And and um, you can certainly tell some of the novice paintings. And and also uh, begin to see areas that you have to grow. By, by observing what your peers are doing. And uh, nothing beats looking at a painting up close. If you are an artist. To see, well, how much paint is there? Are they painting thin? Are they painting thick? What does that do in terms of how the light bounces off of uh, the various colors? How much detail do you really have to add? Now, you can certainly look at uh, videos on YouTube like you're doing today or go to museums. But, um, you know, it's often hard to find folks that are really active in painting right now unless you are someone that tends to go to a lot of art shows or live near a metropolitan area where there are a lot of local art shows, it's sometimes difficult to find folks who are actively painting today 
uh, to look at these images. So it's another good reason to go to an event and, and be able to participate. But it's, it's also important to realize that in many respects, at least for me, art is not so much a competition as a celebration of being able to do this. And there was certainly some, some artwork there that didn't get uh, a whole lot of recognition, but were great paintings, really were great paintings. And, and uh, the judges, I think, did, do a very excellent job at picking the ones that, uh, that should be recognized and, and spreading it around. In, in terms of uh, lifting up uh, new voices and as well as the old familiars and and uh, noticing uh, what's what's truly outstanding. One thing I noticed about the Strata, this is actually the first painting I've, I've painted using this. Mine came with these uh, the hanger units, I guess is what you call them, uh, that can that can take and accept. Um, a stretch canvas as well as panels and but these little metal pieces that actually hold the panel there are kind of large and so I had to adjust them at times so that I could paint behind them otherwise I would have these weird you know four marks on my on my painting where there might not be any paint because they were they were uh, hidden by these metal um, uh, metal holders I guess so other than that, it certainly holds the panels in very well. And uh, it feels very sturdy when you're, when you're painting on this unit. I just have one of the masks in at this point. There's a second that you can attach to it to get even larger paintings. So this is just a, an 11 by 14, and this, this one mask or one section of the mask would work, work probably up to about, a, uh, I would say about a 16 by 20 perhaps before you'd have to attach the other part of the mask to, to go larger than that. And here I'm getting to the foreground. I'm putting in my greens. And of course, when you're only dealing with the um, the primary palette, a simplistic palette of just your primary colors in titanium white, it's uh, very easy to to help get those tonal values correct. So I'm working on that to make sure that it, the foreground I want um, not to be the focal point of this painting. So I want it to, to subtly indicate that it's closer to the viewer but i want your eye to go to those trees and to the clouds the uh, foreground grasses where we see some of the sand and so forth I, I i don't want you to spend a lot of time in that portion of the painting and in this one um although the water i'm, I'm going to treat that water a little bit later it's not going to be the, the focal point. There, there are a few little highlights I'm going to put onto the lake, but the water is really not the star of this show. The star of the show is going to be the trees and the clouds because I want you to feel the wind. It was such a windy day. So I'm trying to use the brushwork and eventually the palette knife and the colors to convey a sense of, of it being a windy day. One thing I've done on my setup, uh, if you happen to have this particular one or maybe something similar, I went to the hardware store and bought a, a smallest uh, plexiglass I could find that was that was reasonably priced and sturdy enough that I thought would make a, a decent enough palette. And then um, I cut it myself to, to fit into this uh, palette holder. Like I said, this is not the official one that goes with the the Mark II that uh, Strata sells with the covers, but but rather um, 
a smaller version, cheaper version, that uh, made primarily for watercolorist, I believe. And so I just fit that plexiglass into it. And underneath it, I put one of those cheap cards that gives you the tonal values from, uh, what, 1 to one to 10. And that way, when as I mix my colors, I've got an easy reference point. Now, the um, contraption itself is kind of a, a neutral gray, as you can tell from the masked color. Uh, so so that's that's not terribly... Uh, I mean, you wouldn't have to have the, the chart of different tonal values, but um, I do find that having one available underneath the plexiglass allows me to mix my mixtures and to immediately uh, be able to judge the tonal value. And that will help you immensely as you grow as a painter to constantly be checking that. I noticed that uh, even after I've been painting for quite a while now, when I go outside especially, I get fooled. I, I look at that scene and I think that I'm mixing a particular tonal value, but when I actually squint and hold it up to, to that chart, sometimes I'm very off. Other artists I know use their iPhone. They'll take a picture. They'll put in a grayscale mode to, to see the lights and the darks and where some of those tonal values are. And, and you certainly could do that as well. But, but this is just another easy way that you could uh, uh, modify that. Now, you can't modify Strata's uh, products all that often or all that much because they're, they're basically made of metal. And so unless you, unless you have some... Uh, metal working shop at your house, you're not going to be able to, to do much with that. But they're virtually indestructible. And they don't weigh too, too much. Obviously, something made of wood is going to travel a little bit lighter than this. There's a John... Um, I'm not sure if it's John, but it's a, there's a Coulter easel that's made of wood that's uh, similar to this design style where you're attaching the, the mast to the tripod and then you've got uh, kind of a shelf which is composed of primarily just a wooden box that will um, sit on your, your tripod legs. And, that, and that's what this does. Then I take a bungee cord, and uh, the bungee cord has my paper towels, and so it's all on that one setup. Because of, of this new space where I'm painting, the one thing I'm going to be doing in the future is that I'm going to go back to using the Cobra uh, water mixable oils. I am noticing now, after having painted for quite a while, that I am still sensitive to the Gamsol mineral spirits. I know that that's one of the best ones to have, but apparently there's just too many fumes, especially during the Augusta plein air when I would bring some of these paintings back to, to this space and, and leave them dry. Uh, I was having some issues with that. I could, I could really tell... It was affecting me in some way. I don't have the best ventilation in this room. And so I'm going to um, switch back to the water, mixable oils to see in that regard that, that shouldn't have any, any effect whatsoever on me because uh, the oil just basically has linseed oil in it. It's uh, made to accept water uh, to, to function uh, very similar to what uh, Gamsol does to, to regular oils. Uh, so that way you don't have to expose yourself to any more fumes and so forth. So And uh, looking again at that, if I stay with the limited palette, there are colors that should work for me. I've already kind of planned out which, which ones I'm going to purchase. So I'm going to use Ultramarine Blue, Chorus for Blue, um, as well as the secondary color is going to be the Phalo Blue. 
and then for my reds I'm going to use two reds because with any primary uh, or limited palette there are um, some colors you can't reach or some temperature adjustments that you're just not going to be able to to reach if you only uh, always use just one red one blue one one yellow so uh, CAD yellow light is going to be the the yellow that I'm choosing with the the cobra line and then like I said the two blues the ultramarine blue and then the phalo blue and then for the reds I need two of those uh, color temperature wise one's a little bit uh, warmer than the other uh, Lizarin, uh, they, they make uh, basically a Lizarin Crimson Permanent. They call it Matter Lake. And so, I think that's what it's called. Or Matter Deep. It's one of the two. <laughs> uh, in the Cobra line. And then, the other one I'm going to use is, uh, I think it's called Pyrrole Red. And that's kind of your fire engine red. So, that particular color will make good, um, good oranges. And it should make um, some good purples as too when you when you mix that with the uh, ultramarine blue. And then the alizarin crimson can can really um, well the matter lake rather or matter deep that they 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 call it in the cobra line uh, really can give you some good darks when you mix it with ultramarine blue. All right, back to the actual painting. As you see me laying down this tree that, that sits on the other side of the lake. So it's a little smaller than the two that are up front in the foreground. And I just want to give that sense that they're sitting back there a little. I added to the green mixture, which was a combination of cadmium yellow light, of course, and ultramarine blue was a little bit of the titanium white. And before all is done, I'll be coming over top of that with even more paint. And uh, there I will be adding some uh, cat yellow light in some, in some form or fashion. The clouds, as you see now, I've added some yellow. I had left the canvas white in those areas, and now uh, I've really finished them out with the uh, titanium white with a little bit of cat yellow light which, which uh, makes those clouds look and appear much warmer than they actually are. And one of the reasons I'm doing that is I'm going to come over top of that again with a palette knife and apply some straight titanium white to, to give those, those clouds uh, a sense of, uh, of the atmosphere. I've also outlined the underneath side of these clouds at this point with the, the uh, pink which is a combination of a little bit of the uh, cat yellow light, uh, some, some uh, titanium white, and then, of course, uh, the cad red medium. And at this point in time, as you can tell, Almost the entire canvas has now been covered. And once you get to this stage, you want to slow down a little bit more. It's so easy to make a bad decision at this point that could have consequences for the entire painting later on. That's why you should always spend a little time, even if you don't do uh, a thumbnail sketch, to at least think in your mind about what what the design is, what what are you trying to accomplish with this particular painting, and have some of that worked out in your head before you ever put uh, the paintbrush on the canvas. That will save you a lot of scraping things off or, or just not uh, putting your elements in the right way for the viewer to, to be held onto your canvas. couple observations I would make when I was looking at other people's work. Now, number one, they were, they were wonderful works, but you do notice a few things. Among, especially the artists that I would estimate as being 
amateur to pro in terms of uh, they're, they're not the top names. They may be selling some artwork um, to, to also some of the novice. Is that it looked to me like a heavy reliance on some of these artists on Sap Green. And um, that does show up. And I didn't like it. In other words, I, I do think you get better greens when you mix them yourself. So I would really urge most people to eliminate green on your palette. Buy the primaries, buy titanium white, and learn how to mix them. You can get an infinite number of varieties of green with various yellows, various blues. And of course, mixing in red to, to dull those colors, saturation down. So remember that uh, paint companies always want to sell you more colors and you don't really need more colors. What you need is more time mixing a few colors so that you can see the full range of color that you can provide your painting without uh, purchasing uh, so many. And by the way, this also, one of the big reasons for using a minimum palette is that you get so much variety from such uh, a few colors that you, you're also creating color harmony. Nothing defeats a painting like seeing a particular color that hasn't been used anywhere else. And it just, it just makes the painting look unreal. Whereas you can take a, what I would say is perhaps not the greatest composition or rend, you know, I'm, I'm saying rending, rendering, I should probably say interpretation of a scene um, because you don't really want to get too detailed. At least uh, the artwork that I like is, is artwork that's not very detailed. It, it looks like it has a lot of detail, but when you get up close, you see that the artist is really suggesting a lot of it with just his or her use of color and, and the tonal values. Notice how I continue to step back to make sure to see how this is being read. This is also the stage of the painting in which I'm not sure at this moment where this is actually going to produce a painting that I might sell. This might produce a video, uh, uh, and it might not even be worthy of a video, is what I'm thinking right now in my head as I'm looking at this scene. I'm noticing things that you're noticing. Like is that green that's that's supposed to be sitting back in the in the picture plane? It seems to be jumping out too far into the the foreground. It it looks a lot like the foreground grasses, so I'm taking note of that. And the little tree also is popping forward a little too much. So I'll have to do something about that. course one of the fears I always have as I do the videos is that well I'm doing all this recording I'm doing the voiceover is the painting worthy <laughs> in this case I, I must I must admit well or maybe I shouldn't say that I, I think the painting looks pretty good the, the final product if you will but I'm not completely convinced Sometimes what I've ended up doing is throwing away paintings that I wasn't pleased with, only to discover when I 
have also done a few paintings where I wasn't that happy with it, but decided, well, what the heck, I'll try to sell them, see if other people have the same experience. Obviously, they're not going to want to buy a painting if they feel there are major problems in it. And um, since I'm more of an amateur and I get the opportunity to put some of my work on um, the internet to, to be sold, it will give me a gauge. And to my surprise, sometimes the painting I would not suggest as being my best work sells and sells quickly. Where is the difference? Why am I misreading these? Part of it is the style. The palette knife paintings I'm doing seem to sell even when I don't always like how it looks. Yet, it does appear that people are seeing something in my palette knife landscapes that they must think is creative and somewhat unique for them to be purchasing them. I only use a few uh, palette knives. Uh, uh, kind of the, the standard diamond is, is the one I use the most. There's also one that um, has a little bit of a elliptical shape to it. I use those for some highlights and tree branches. There's another one that looks like, or I think it's called kind of a spatula, where it has a little bit of a bend in the um, the arm of it. And it's great for putting down a lot more paint. And I have found that to be helpful sometimes in skies. But that's, that's pretty much it for the palette knives that I use. Now you notice I keep walking back and forth to see, is it looking good from a distance? And in many respects, your paintings may look terrible if you're right up on the canvas looking at it uh, as you're painting and saying, oh my goodness, this just looks like a mess of purple or this is, just looks like a mess of green. Well, take a step back and see if something else shows itself. Oftentimes what happens is as you do that, you find that no, actually you're, you may be doing a lot better than you thought. Because your mind and your eyes fill in what it needs to interpret the scene. Now here soon, I, I think you'll be, you'll be, well, first I'm going to work on these trees. And then soon after I'm working on these two trees, you'll see me reach for the palette knife and begin to do some wild things to, to try to fix this painting before I call it done. Here I'm, I'm basically trying to put the leaves of the trees in. And I might tell you that um, this was just meant to to be kind of the, um, the first go around at this. And then I would come over top of the palette knife. But no, actually, I made some mistakes on these trees I didn't really like. And then the thought came to my mind, uh, how can I fix this? And since I had been painting lightly... Um, not not too much heavy paint. I felt like I could go over the top of it with a palette knife and get some more interesting shapes and textures into the trees. So, uh, so you get to see as you're watching this, the first attempt and whether you you thought that uh, this looked uh, good to you or not. There's always various decisions that an artist makes 
And once you make that decision, you have to stick with it because there's, there's just simply no way to really go back. And uh, especially when you make the decision like this, that you're going to paint a tree in the foreground. And in order for this to stand out, you're not going to be uh, too careful. So you're going to be applying more paint on top of other paint. Now, thinking back, uh, this was probably the mistake. I should have left some of the sky area undone so that I wouldn't have to paint the green over top of everything else. Let me know if you like these long extended uh, videos. I In the past, people have commented that they like to see every stroke. Obviously, uh, this video, there's there's not as much of the palette like I've, I've just mentioned in terms of watching me mix the colors because there, there's not much to mix. <laughs> uh, when you only have four colors on the palette, uh, almost every color I'm putting down at this point has all all four of them in it. It's just a varying, varying uh, the degree of it. And, and honestly, if you're trying to watch people and videos for how they mix their colors i i guess you'll find some value in, in watching a couple of those but the the only way you're really going to sense how much people are using is for you to do it yourself invest in those uh, charts that show you the tonal values start mixing your colors in fact you may not even want to uh, paint a painting right away just take and practice getting the tonal value matches for various colors. So you might take ultramarine blue, um, make sure that uh, it's as dark as the darkest uh, one on your sheet uh, for, from your, um, your tonal value uh, scale, and then um, add slowly add the titanium white and mix all the way down to the lightest light uh, and, and compare it by squinting uh, to the chart. And that will help your painting immensely. And uh, continue to work on that as a little exercise. And that will help your plein air painting as well as your studio painting more than uh, um, probably anything else that you could do. I've used uh, expensive paints. I've used cheaper paints. I would stay away from student grade paints. The only two that I was able to use that acted anything like the professional grade paints was Winton and Gamblin's 1980. But it was obvious that there was a lot of filler in even those brands. So, and then when you begin to look at the cost, you would be better off for example, in my in my estimation, to buy the professional grade paints and get your primaries, if you will, to be the cheaper paints. So, for example, let me give you an example here. So, yellow. Cad yellow light or cad yellow medium, uh, whichever one you're going to use for a, a particular limited palette, is going to 150 milliliter tube at, in 2023 is going to set you back about 40 to $50 in the professional line. We're talking gambling, Utrecht. It's going to cost even more money if you go with something like the Williamsburg or the Michael Hardings. So you may want to switch. So don't, instead of saying, okay, well, there's such a big price difference, I'm just going to buy student grade. No, I would suggest, look, try Hansa Yellow Light, Hansa Yellow Medium. These are a little bit more modern colors, so we don't know exactly how they will hold up over the, the test of time like you would with uh, cadmium colors. But I venture to trust the scientists that have been studying these mixtures and doing experiments on the light fastness of them, so... I, I, I don't hesitate to recommend using some of those. And you might discover that, look, a Hansa Yellow Light and Hansa Yellow Medium are usually about half the price 
of the cadmiums. They have, different, of course, different properties in terms of mixing strengths, but I have found them to be pretty comparable to the cadmiums and a way to get, uh, well, number one, to stop using anything with cadmium, if that's a concern, and then uh, you can save some money and you would still be using a professional paint on your palette for yellow, for example. And that can save you some some effort and time. And, and that way, too, it's, it's it'll still be a much better experience than painting with a student-grade cadmium, which is going to be predominantly uh, little cadmium and a lot of chalk. <laughs> uh, as you know, chalk is, is the primary filler that they put in those tubes. The other thing I would advise is uh, stay away from buying the small tubes. Buy the big tubes, the 150 milliliters, because um, then it's it's also uh, advantageous in terms of uh, the price per uh, per unit. Uh, just compare it in the store, and you'll see. You know, buying a 37 milliliter tube for 20 bucks when you can buy a 150 milliliter tube for you know 45 or 50. Well, that's a lot more paint. Now, you might be saying, well, but I want to paint outdoors, and isn't it kind of heavy to carry around? Well, another way to combat that is, instead of having those, you know, 50 tubes of little paints, uh, the 37 milliliter kind, and, and, and uh, buying everything that uh, those companies want you to do, uh, limit your color choices to just the primaries and titanium white. That's only four tubes. So... And then uh, take into the field the ones that you've already been using in your studio. And uh, after you've used them for a while, uh, they're not going to be full tubes, right? So that's going to knock down the weight and still allow you to get the best bang for your buck in terms of your paint uh, that you're using. Now, a lot of folks say, well, is there much difference between, so if I'm using professional grade, is there a lot of difference between the companies? It depends. I've seen some colors that are totally a different color from one brand to another. Oftentimes, uh, what they say is a certain color. Uh, it, it may be an entirely different pigment, and so you got to check the, the labels on the tubes and compare the pigment. Every pigment has a, a number. You may already know this, but every pigment has a number. And so you can find out what they are calling, uh, but uh, brands will call their paints by different names. I think, for example, in the Michael Harding line, um, you won't find a Hansa Yellow Light or Hansa Yellow Medium. So you have to look at the pigment, the, uh, the pigment number on it. And then uh, you'll find you'll find the comparable color in other lines for it, and uh, you you will find that with every paint company that there are just different names that they sometimes use for the same pigment. So if you're used to using a, a particular color and you, you don't see the name mentioned, it's probably in the line. You just haven't uh, you haven't correctly identified the pigment which produces that particular color. Another thing to keep in, in mind if you're trying to save a little bit of money on, on different paints, for example, when I was new, you know, I was I tried more colors than I needed. So when you keep the palette uh, to just the primaries, that's going to help your cost. Another is uh, if, you, if you're if you going to end up using a, a few more colors, uh, phalo blue is a popular one to use for skies, for example, as as opposed to ultramarine blue or in combination with ultramarine blue. Uh, phalo blue um, is cerulean blue. So basically, okay, do you need both tubes on your palette? No. I would buy a small tube of phthalo blue, a 37 milliliter. It'll last you a long time because that thing is so strong. You, you really don't want to put a bunch of that on your palette. It can ruin everything very quickly. You just need a couple of drops. Um, and, uh, if you mix that with t uh, enough titanium white, well, that's, that's essentially what cerulean blue is. So you don't need cerulean blue. Just get the phalo blue, and you can make it yourself, 
and you'll save a lot more money because the only thing that the paint company's done is take a little bit of their phthalo blue and mix in a bunch of titanium white and stick it in a tube for you and call it cerulean. So you don't need that one. Now, you may want a few convenience colors if, if you're not into a um, very simplistic palette and you don't want to mix every single thing. You may want to add some earth tones like uh, yellow ochre is a handy one, burnt sienna. Those two colors in particular can be handy to have in your palette as well. And they're relatively cheap because they're earth tones. They can also function as primaries, by the way. Burnt sienna could be your red primary. Yellow ochre could be your yellow primary. For blue, uh, you could try the, the Zorin palette. And uh, for Zorin's palette, he used ivory black which when in combination with some other colors can look blue in your paintings. Uh, another one from the Zorin, if you don't want to use the, uh, the cadmiums, is uh, vermilion. Uh, can be used as the red. By the way, the the, uh, the Zorin palette, probably you don't want to use that for landscapes. It, uh, it does work very nicely, though, for portraits. Hey, now, I'm not saying that you couldn't use it for landscapes. And, and certainly you can find some landscapes that uh, have used the Zorin. Uh, the Zorin palette, by the way, is uh, basically, uh, well, it would have been more like... Um, a uh, lead white, a uh, vermilion for the red, uh, a yellow ochre for the blue, for the yellow, of course, and an ivory black. So once again, four colors. But the cheapest that you can purchase. Have you noticed that? Uh, in the good old days, the artists did the same thing we're trying to do now. Uh, spend as little money as they could because they they wanted to get as much money for their works, right? And so if you can. If you can uh, reduce cost on the supply and the and the product production, uh, that's always going to help you. So they would use uh, very very saturated colors very uh, sparingly. And of course, many of them would mix their their own oils up and stick them in tubes once tubes were invented. Uh, before tubes, there wasn't too many uh, plein air. Uh, paintings going on. The uh, paint tune was uh, the, the perhaps the most uh, single most uh, important invention for the painter uh, that that there has ever been. The ability to take paint on location uh, was was almost impossible before the invention of the paint tube. Here you see me applying now with the the palette knife. And here, in order to get the effect, I'm taking basically pure titanium white and sticking it in the middle of these clouds to see if, if that makes the titanium white even whiter. And I would argue that it does. Well, we're, we're getting to the point in which um, I'm working on more of the details. I've got some work on the clouds and, and those two trees coming up that you'll be able to witness. So uh, if you were expecting a blow-by-blow -blow account of this particular painting, um, you may be sadly uh, disappointed. I hope that we've covered some other topics while you've watched me apply paint in this painting that uh, may be equally or, or even more beneficial to you than the other content. If you have enjoyed this, uh, by the way, this would be another good place to say, uh, please subscribe, give a thumbs up, leave a question or a comment of some kind. That would be awesome, and I would greatly appreciate it. And then uh, you could also help me out by, by maybe sharing this on your own your own uh, social networks.
maybe some of your painting friends or others might might appreciate it. Oh, and by the way, I have also found out that uh, uh, paintings, um, especially these kind of videos, uh, don't just work for artists. I think they work for people that have sleep problems. A couple of my um, first paintings I've done like this, I, I actually fell asleep during the, the recording of the voiceover. Didn't even realize it. Put it up on YouTube and somebody commented, uh, we can hear you snoring in this particular video. Hmm. How does that happen? Well, it happens because I tend to do the voiceovers after a full day work or painting as kind of last thing before I go to bed. And sometimes I'm just so exhausted from work, painting, and doing the voiceover that I fall asleep during the voiceover. So if you're any of those folks out there that are concerned about me, yeah, I'm getting more sleep now. But this still may happen because I think it's about 11.30 and I'm doing the voiceover for this one. And see, here's where I'm, I'm deciding that I don't like some things. And so, in order to create a little bit more chaos, a little bit more sense of... Uh, that that the uh, colors are, are not so delicate and precious. I'm I'm taking this palette knife and just just start starting to just kind of feel my way through it and and uh, pretty quickly you're gonna see that uh, I'm sorry I'm standing in front of the deck on the entire picture there. That's great. That will help you out immensely. Um, I have to work on that in the next video is that I will actually work very quickly. And sometimes that, that really can help you if you see something and just with some wild abandon start moving some paint around. One of the nice things about uh, Alla Prima painting, which is all at once, is that the paint's not dry. This is oil paint, so you can go right back into it and do some things. And like here, that line of trees was just too meticulous. It it just did not look very real. And so all I'm doing is taking that palette knife and 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 moving that paint around some uh to give it a different feel, a different effect. Sometimes your best painting will be when you're not really thinking so much about it. You're trying to uh, suggest feelings, not necessarily reproduce the photograph. What fun would that be? This is also a stage in which I'm consciously saying... What other colors need to be present? What needs to be left out? Are there some highlights that need to be put in? By the way, at the end of this video, I will have some suggestions on other videos that I've already created that you might enjoy. Yes, I'm still here. I've just backed up to, to look at this painting. Here I go. Now I'm blocking the whole thing for you again.
Maybe I should title this one David Blocks Painting with Ugly Shirt. I wonder if anyone would watch that. Yep, and you can see exactly what I'm doing here. But sometimes this happens is that you get so enthusiastic about where to put the paint down, you're not even thinking about the video that, that you're taking behind you. Uh, and this is clearly the case here. Uh, for half the video, I was at least standing away as I put the paint on. But but now I wanted to, to really get in there and get these clouds fin finished. So there, I remember there's a camera. <laughs> We'll take a little bit of a break so you can just watch me paint for a few minutes. With these small paintings, I tried to finish them within about an hour, hour and a half. I love how you can use a palette knife to really move the paint around once you've got some on the canvas. You can actually do uh, a lot of your own mixtures on the canvas rather than on the palette. Sometimes that can really produce some happy accidents, I think someone once said. The uh, gloves I'm using, by the way, uh, if you're curious, uh, you, I think I just picked these up at one of the big box stores. So nothing fancy. I think they cost me maybe $10. The uh, tripod I'm using with this, by the way, is the Slick U8000. Purchased it uh, back when I had a different setup, but the tripod it's it's aluminum, so it weighs a little bit more than um, than the um, carbon ones today. But this one is is really a useful tripod. It has a oh what do I want to call it? Well, it it spreads out more in terms of the legs, and so that makes the setup a little bit more stable than some of the carbon fiber that um, don't have that kind of expanse. I'm actually using uh, two, uh, two, uh, two tripods. One to hold my iPhone. I, I shoot this all on just a simple iPhone SE. And then um, if you're wondering, this fantastic editing job... Uh, is done on Loom, Luma Fusion. That program only costs like about 20 bucks. So, and then as you are well aware, I barely touch or edit scenes. I give you it all as it is happening. Isn't that incredible? Yes. It, it also saves me a lot of time. So, instead of cutting a lot of things out of this particular video, I just I just uh, kept the film ro rolling and um, 
you get to see every single stroke or at least my back in some kind of an awful t-shirt. If you have suggestions on uh, how you would like me to um, improve some of these videos, by by all means, uh, drop some down. As long as you're not nasty, I'll, I'll publish them. Remember that um, the spirit should be that you're suggesting uh, helpful criticism. Here I'm signing my name to the artwork. Sometimes I do that. And then I'll take a look, and then I notice that I still am not done. <laughs> and uh, you'll notice, though, that um, this happens, this will happen to you. You step back and you think, ah, that's not quite right. And then you go back to it. Sometimes you'll ruin a painting, sometimes you'll make it better. Here I'm putting a few highlights on that distant tree with the palette knife, which makes it easier to put thicker paint on top of thinner paint. Remember, thick over lean. Uh, that's the rule to, to make the paint stick and appear well. And then the other trees that are coming from the side and the foreground a little closer to the viewer. Pretty soon I'm going to just start slapping on some paint with the palette knife. And um, I think I was fortunate that I didn't turn out to make mud, but rather some interesting greens with a bunch of sky holes that uh, I think the sky holes look fairly uh, believable because of this technique that I've used, which is basically, hey, let's see if I can create a mess. Some have asked me about my background. Obviously, I have had extensive education. I took a high school art class. No, seriously, that was the only class I took for, for years and years. And we did one painting in class. Um, I was one of those um, kids that was always trying to push the envelope. And so I painted a circle with some lines. I was well aware at the time that there were contemporary artists that we're doing similar things and ending up in museums with nothing but, you know, a couple of colors and, and, and these kind of flag designs. Uh, saw some Rothko paintings at some point, I'm sure, and uh, decided, hey, uh, let's just draw a circle, um, use some reds and yellows and turn that in. And uh, I, I can tell you that my, my um, high school art teacher was was not a big fan of contemporary art. Um, also took one class in college. Wonderful professors in each of those, those two classes, by the way. In the college course, once again, it was, wasn't just about painting. It was about uh, art in general. It was a uh, liberal arts college. And so, Eureka College, and so the uh, professor had us do some some different types of assignments. Remarkably, in each class, my professors did not see some kind of uh, genius when it came to producing art. Now, why am I mentioning all this? Well, if you are somebody that's it's just picking this up and starting. I hope you'll find it encouraging that a lot of artists don't have raw talent. A lot of artists are just people who decided to keep painting even when maybe they should have stopped. And the more and more you paint the more practice, labor, and time you put into it, amazingly, you get better. Okay, but this painting might not be the greatest example of me getting better. I'll admit that. 
but you are going to have times in which you have to get through a painting and that you will learn in the process, even if it does not turn out to be one of your most stellar paintings. Here's the palette knife. And here's where I start really ratcheting up the color on this tree, these two trees, trying to pull them forward. Now, what I had down was more true to the photograph I had, but I realized that the painting needed something more. And I would also advise that you will pick this up as you paint more and more. And there will be times in which you choose correctly to say, I'm not going to be a slave to the photograph. The photograph doesn't catch all the details, especially in the shadows. There are color shifts everywhere. But does your camera pick it all up? No, it doesn't. The human eye is still a better instrument than any camera. Well, I need to thank you at this point as this video is coming to a close for your patience, willing to learn and watch with me. I appreciate it. Those of you that fell asleep, you're welcome. If you've got ideas for subject matter that you would like me to paint in the future, please let me know. It does take longer the more paint you apply to a painting. For this particular painting, I use some Galkid uh, gel. And so if you need some product or some medium to help you with yours, uh, I would mention that. Also a reminder that um, don't use uh, Gamsol as your medium, especially if you paint thin. That will create uh, very thin layers of paint that can quite possibly be lifted up and destroyed by the varnish that you apply later on when you think the painting is, is totally dry. And in some cases, the, the painting is totally dry. And uh, still, uh, Gamvar may may take up some of the color because you have uh, added too much Gamsol into your paint mixtures, uh, using it as a medium instead of what it's intended for, which is simply the cleaning of brushes and such. Just a, a quick note, uh, doesn't mean that I've ever had that happen to me. Oh yes, it did happen to me. <laughs> I destroyed a wonderful painting like that, so uh, be forewarned about, about how much um, you use those mineral spirits. All right, here in just a second, I'm, I'm going to finish it up. One or two more strokes with the palette knife. So thank you so much for watching. And I will see you in the next video.